thank you for the kind introduction uh, and uh, yeah since you since you kind of uh, already gave a uh, background about my research so again you know if you look at the next slide that kind of you know, gives you a background about what i do uh, which um, uh, tangaraj uh, probably probably you know, explain that in um, much more detail <laughs> anyway uh, today uh, you kind of you know, see the um, title of my talk so we'll be looking at uh challenges as well as strategies in uh, translational uh, research uh, practice so in the next hour what we'll do is that we'll try to look at couple of topics so we, uh, first of all we'll try to look at uh, uh, what exactly is uh, translation research and then uh, then you know we will we'll kind of try to um, look at uh, uh, briefly what are small molecules and uh, macro molecules and then after that we'll kind of try to go through a summary where we'll try to see uh, the steps involved in um, drug discovery and then we will kind of try to do a case study where we'll see how translational um, um, drug discovery actually um, helped in the development of a anti cancer agent which is called as imatinib uh, and then we'll try to look at uh, some of the uh, challenges uh, as well as um, opportunities in uh, translational uh, research and then we will see how um, nursing profession can contribute in uh, developing translation research so with that sort of a background first we'll kind of try to see what exactly is uh, translation research so probably i will kind of start with the story here so uh, back in 15th to 16th century uh, as you guys know europeans like to travel so uh, back in those days they will travel in ships for months and years and the goal was to see whether they can look for new lands or whether they can do trade and then eventually conquer so that was their game plan and then you had these soldiers and uh, sailors they would uh, sail for long uh, you know for months um, uh, as well as years and then uh, again uh, uh, during that time uh, uh, what used to happen was that many of these sailors would suffer from a disease called as scurvy so if you look at the uh, disease um, scurvy that uh, actually is uh, because of lack of vitamin c and then uh, during those early times uh, some of the captains in the ship uh, found out that suppose if these um, uh, sailors are able to con um, consume um, citrus fruits such as lemon or oranges then that will help them uh, to kind of an overcome this and uh, unfortunately this was not implemented and then between 15 to 18 century more than 2 million sailors died because of scurvy yeah so uh, i was kind of now giving a background about uh, translation research and then if you uh, look at this slide here so uh, i was saying that back in the uh, 15th century uh, Europeans would travel for uh, months and years, and then uh, they will uh, end up with a um, disease called as scurvy, which was because of lack of uh, vitamin C. And and then although uh, some of the captains in the ship knew that probably if they uh, consume um, uh, oranges or lemon juice, that will help them. But then uh, 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 they never really talked about that with the uh, concerned people. and then uh, because of that you can see that in 15 to 18th century close to 2 million sailors died and then only after 200, 200 years in uh, 1747 one of the uh, navy physician dr lind he did a proper clinical trial where he kind of you know, tested the effect of this uh, citrus fruits on uh, sailors and then he could clearly see that uh, in in all the sailors who took this uh, citrus fruit they actually did not show scurvy and then uh, they were able to survive those long journeys and then back in 1795 british navy made it mandatory for all the sailors who travel to take uh, lemon juice or any source of citrus fruits so again uh, this kind of and tells you that although uh, people discovered uh, that uh, if you take citrus fruits that will be helpful but for that entire process to undergo implementation it took 200 years such a long time and uh, that's where this uh, translation research comes into play so if you kind of uh, look at this uh, uh, slide here that's what you see here so when i looking at basic science research 
we have lots of um, discoveries uh, which are all happening and unfortunately they don't really reach the intended target which is ultimately to help in uh, patient care where uh, they can be imp implemented in um, clinical practice unfortunately uh, that's not happening uh, because uh, there is a lack of gap or there is a gap between basic science as well as uh, clinical science and um, this is where uh, the uh, national uh, institute of health in the us they actually uh, found out that um, this was a major gap in uh, uh, drug development and uh, drug discovery and because of that back in uh, 2012 they actually uh, started an agency called as ncats which is national center for advancing uh, translation sciences so uh, here uh, you can kind of uh, 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 see the definition of translation research and then the whole point is that uh, you kind of try to uh, bridge the gap between basic science discoveries as well as um, in science with the ultimate goal of uh, uh, translating all the basic science uh, research funding into um, uh, clinical practice and uh, when you look at translation research you can look at it as um, as uh, um, made up of at least four different stages. You have stages T0 all the way to T4. So uh, when you are looking at T0 here, uh, there you kind of do the basic science research and try to discover a novel therapeutic or a novel diagnostic agent, or uh, you can also develop novel um, biomarkers. And then when you're looking at uh, stages T1, T2, and T3, that's where you conduct um, clinical trials where you test the, uh, your hypothesis in, in actual uh, patient samples. And then in T4, what you do is that you do the um, impl in, um, implementation of your findings. So this is where you kind of go through this entire cycle where you um, make sure that the uh, fundamental discoveries that are happening in basic science they will be able to uh, go all the way and then um, they will be uh, useful in patient care because if you look at all the government organizations you can see that uh, they actually spend uh, a lot of money on basic science and uh, unfortunately uh, oftentimes you uh, these um, basic science discoveries don't go all the way and um, they won't really get implemented in um, clinical practice so this is where when looking at translation research, uh, that's kind of trying to uh, bridge this gap between uh, basic science as well as um, clinical science. And now uh, the other thing is that uh, to implement a successful uh, translation research, it's uh, very important to have team coordination. So when you're looking at translation research, there are a number of stakeholders starting from basic scientists start, and you have um, clinicians, you have patients, you have pharmaceutical companies, you have non-profit organizations, as well as uh, policymakers and government and the community. So when I'm looking at these uh, clinicians, that uh, includes um, physicians, that um, that uh, includes pharmacists, um, that also uh, um, includes um, nursing practitioners, and also all the other uh, allied science fields. And um, again, you know, you can see that when you're looking at uh, translation research, uh, one has to have a big team and uh, all the um, team uh, members have equal um, responsibility to contribute. And then only uh, you can truly uh, see the benefits of um, translation research. For example, there are uh, there are a couple of them. Um, if you uh, look at uh, the uh, application of translation research, there are a few examples where some uh, drugs were successfully developed. For example, we have uh, imatinib, which is an anti-cancer agent, which is used to treat a uh, cancer called as CML or cyto uh, or uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And also there is another drug which is called as uh, darsatinib and that was also developed uh, to treat uh, chronic myelogenous uh, leukemia. And again, uh, both of these drugs were um, developed using um, translational research. I will look at, uh, I will kind of you know, uh, talk about the discovery of um, imatinib and how translation research um, contributed to its discovery uh, briefly today. Uh, now again, when you are looking at the um, ultimate goal of uh, translation research, um, 
basically you want to improve patient care by uh, making sure that basic science um, findings are translated all the way into clinical practice uh, now let's kind of uh, uh, briefly talk about what exactly are uh, small molecules so uh, when i are looking at current uh, drug therapy you can see that almost 90% uh, of the drugs are all based on um, small molecules what exactly are uh, small molecules so uh, these are molecules which have low molecular weight here is an example uh, this is a well known drug and it's called as aspirin and you can notice that it has a very small molecular weight about 180 and then we have uh, another commonly used drug uh, you can see the chemical structure with a very low molecular weight which is called uh, which is about 151 and this drug is acetaminophen or uh, tylenol and um, this where you can see that uh, most of the drugs which are in the market they are all uh, small molecule drugs and then they have a uh, molecular weight of about um, 900 dal daltons or below so today uh, what i will do is that i will kind of and try to give a brief summary about how uh, a small molecule drug called as imatinib was um, discovered using translation research and then also um, nowadays as you guys know with covid going on people are talking about vaccines uh, that's where you can see that uh, there are lots of these uh, so called macro molecules or large molecules or which are also called as um, biologics so they basically include uh, cytokines and antibodies as well as vaccine so uh, i guess with the covid pandemic going on people are very familiar with vaccines and when you're looking at these vaccine they are all nothing but um, large um, biological agents and they have um, molecular weights anywhere ranging from 3000 all the way to um, 150000 and if you kind of uh, look at this plot here that kind of uh, gives you an idea and uh, here you can see aspirin which is a small molecule which has a very low molecular weight and on the other hand when you're looking at other biological therapies such as monoclonal antibodies you can see that they are nothing but very large um, macro molecules and um, also we can uh, look at some uh, trend in uh, trends in drug development so if you see the data from um, uh, last year 2021 us fda approved about 15 new drugs and then out of that close to uh, 14 were um, biologics or um, large molecules so as you can tell uh, these days um, biological therapies are picking up pace and then uh, we can see uh, uh, we kind of can see that uh, more and more of this um, biological agents are being uh, used in uh, used to treat many uh, diseases so with uh, that uh, sort of a background now i'll give you a brief summary about uh, drug development what are the steps involved in discovering a new um, drug molecule so uh, first of all now we know that uh, suppose if you want to discover a new drug for for example covid 19 then uh, how you can uh, go about that whether you are in academic institute or whether you are in a pharmaceutical institute what are the steps involved so uh, this is where uh, first thing is that you can use computation modeling so right now we we have access to uh, plenty of computation software where um, suppose if you know the uh, 3d structure of your molecular target whether it's a enzyme or a protein you can um, um, uh, look at the binding sites in 3d and then based on that you can uh, develop a potential uh, molecular library and um, again when you are using this computation modeling softwares um, um, they can drastically decrease the time as well as money spent in um, discovering um, novel molecules in therapy uh, so once you uh, use this computation modeling software then after that uh, you, uh, if you are able to identify a novel molecule what is the next step next step is um, synthesis so if you are in a uh, small molecule drug discovery then you have to make a um, library of uh, molecules so again when you're looking at uh, chemistry um, this can be uh, challenging depending on the complexity of your uh, chemical structure and then in the um, uh, in the next slide uh, you can see what is the next step so uh, uh, so basically once you have synthesized a large um, library of compounds then what you had to do is that uh, you had to uh, try to assess their biological activity so this is where you can carry out uh, what is called as preclinical studies so um, 
when you're looking at um, lead clinical studies, uh, we can do in vitro as well as uh, in vivo studies. So this is where you can use things such as enzyme-based assays, or you can do uh, cell culture assays. And also, more importantly, you can do uh, toxicity studies in um, animals to assess the safety and efficacy of your drug molecule. And then after that, um, Again, uh, uh, you have to see that when you are conducting these uh, preclinical uh, studies, uh, the chances of success are very limited. For example, if you start with 10,000 molecules, and after that uh, you can filter them, and then uh, probably you uh, you can get up to 250 uh, drug candidates. And then again, uh, after you complete all the safety and efficacy testing, you may end up with just um, one molecule. So you can see that there are high uh, addition rates. So this is where translational uh, research can come into play. So once you, once you kind of get into the uh, translation research, then you can try to uh, look at some of the uh, shortcomings of this uh, preclinical uh, studies, and then you can try to uh, develop uh, uh, methodology, which will increase the uh, likelihood of success. So, uh, what next? So imagine you kind of have identified a potential drug candidate by carrying out preclinical drug discovery. What is the next step? So in the next step, you can go forward and then you can start doing clinical trials in humans. So when you're looking at clinical trials, there are three different phases. You have phase one, phase two, as well as phase three. So when you're looking at phase one trial, so this is where you, you have healthy participants. And this is where you try to assess the safety as well as uh, pharmacokinetic um, properties of your drug candidate. And then if everything goes well, then you kind of take it to the phase two level. So uh, in phase two level, you actually have patients with disease. So um, for example, if you want to discover a drug for COVID-19 infection, so in phase two uh, clinical trials, you have a population of patients who are uh, suffering from COVID-19 infection, and then you kind of want to give a therapy to see whether it's going to be effective. And then when you are uh, uh, when you're looking at uh, phase three trials, this is where suppose if you are able to see good uh, safety as well as efficacy in phase two trials, then you uh, carry it forward to phase four, or so sorry, uh, phase three trials. And this is where you have a large population. So you have at least thousand or more patients who have the same disease. And then if all goes well, then uh, uh, you can uh, apply uh, to uh, kind of market the drug. And then after that, this uh, uh, phase four starts. Now, um, basically, when you're looking at this entire process of uh, drug discovery, this is time consuming. So you can see that uh, this can cost up to 10 to uh, 15 years, and also it can cost more than $2 billion. Was there a question there? Someone, yeah. Again, uh, I guess uh, um, uh, probably you know. Uh, I kind of gonna give a uh, brief summary about the entire uh, drug discovery process. So, uh, anyone has any uh, questions up until now? Feel free to ask. Then I can uh, uh, move on to the next level. Hearing none, I will I will continue. So again. Uh, this slide kind of gives you a summary about um, steps involved in uh, the discovery process. So now uh, what we'll do is that uh, we'll kind of try to do a case study. So we'll try to see how translational uh, research uh, helped in the discovery of an anti-cancer agent called as imatinib. So uh, he, uh, uh, here you can see the uh, structure of this drug called as imatinib. So if you look at uh, this particular drug, it is used to treat a um, cancer called as chronic myelogenism leukemia or uh, CML. And uh, this is known to bind to a tyrosine kinase called as BCR Abelson kinase. And uh, you can see that uh, this is not a cheap drug. Uh, this is sold by the company uh, Sibagagi. Right now they are called as uh, Novartis. And uh, in Canada for a 100 milligram um, brand name drug, it uh, costs close to uh, $30. So now we'll try to see how exactly uh, translational research helped in the discovery of this drug. So if you uh, look at this slide here, this kind of gives a background information about uh, protein kinases. So basically when you're looking at um, imatinib, 
that is known to act as a inhibitor of a protein kinase called as Abelson kinase. And when you're looking at the role of these uh, protein kinases, what they do is that they are involved in a um, normal physiological process called as phosphorylation. And if you see the role of phosphorylation, that's important in uh, carrying out number of normal uh, physiological functions such as um, uh, normal uh, cell growth. And it turns out that in certain types of cancers, there is excessive uh, phosphorylation. And when that happens, uh, that can lead to uh, cancer cell uh, proliferation. So this is where when looking at uh, uh, the drug um, imatinib, that is known to bind to a uh, tyrosine kinase called as BCR Abelson kinase and it acts as a reversible and competitive inhibitor. So um, this kind of an, uh, uh, gives you an idea about uh, the um, mechanism of action of uh, imatinib. So you can see that uh, it, it acts as a competitive uh, inhibitor of the natural substrate called as ATP and that helps in um, uh, decreasing cancer cell proliferation. So now we'll try to, uh, try to understand how exactly uh, translational uh, research contributed to the discovery of this drug imatinib. So back in 1990s, Siba uh, Gaigi um, company, which is based in um, Switzerland, right now they are called as um, Novartis. They started uh, developing uh, a research program and the goal was to see whether they can target uh, protein kinases to develop uh, anti-cancer agents. And they actually uh, conducted um, uh, a number of experiments and then um, they were able to uh, identify that if they have this type of a chemical feature, which is called as the phenyl amino uh, this uh, template showed uh, promising activity. And then they uh, went on and then they um, carried out some more uh, structural activity relationship uh, studies what exactly is that? So I can give a, a brief example. So basically, um, they used a chemistry approach called as fragment-based drug design. And there what you do is that you keep on adding uh, different chemical features to a main molecule and then see whether that will uh, provide a safe and effective drug candidate. You can look at it more like a uh, Lego game. So you, uh, you see that kids uh, play with all these Legos, so you have different pieces and then you join them and then you can make buildings or you can make cars. So uh, you can look at this approach in a um, similar way. And uh, this is where uh, they were able to see that uh, uh, if they're able to come up with a certain type of a template, uh, it was able to show activity towards a few uh, protein kinases. And this is where uh, translational um, research uh, comes into play. So um, at that time, scientists from Siba uh, um, Gaigi were in contact with uh, um, Dr. Uh, Drucker, so Dr. Uh, Brian Drucker, who was a basic science uh, researcher from uh, Oregon Health and Science uh, University, USA. So Dr. Uh, Drucker uh, worked on uh, 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 leukemia. In, in particular, he was able to isolate uh, cancer cells from patients who had the disease, chronic myelogenous leukemia. And then he could see that uh, some of the compounds uh, which were synthesized by Siba Gaigi were able to uh, actually uh, prevent the activation of a uh, protein called as BCR Abelson kinase. So um, that was a uh, big discovery. And then uh, he was uh, very, uh, excited about uh, uh, this particular field and then uh, uh, he wanted to see whether um, they can develop a potential drug molecule for uh, treating patients with chronic myelogenous leukemia. And then uh, he uh, collaborated with a uh, clinician. Who was that? So uh, Dr. Charles Sawyers. So uh, Dr. Charles Sawyer was from UCLA and then I uh, he was a uh, physician and then uh, he was dealing with patients who had uh, chronic myelogenous leukemia. So you can see that uh, uh, we have a combination of a best scientist uh, combining with the uh, clinician and then they were able to convince the uh, pharmaceutical company Siba Gaigi uh, to uh, push and then uh, go forward with the uh, clinical trial of uh, one of the uh, potent um, drug candidates which they developed, which is called as imatinib. 
and not only that uh, at that time uh, so uh, whenever you look looking at pharmaceutical companies they are uh, in the end you can see that they are all nothing but a uh, business and then they are also interested in uh, making uh, profit because they, they know that and they have to invest uh, invest lot of money in their research and development and then in the end they want to see whether they can uh, recover all that money and also if they can make um, profit that is uh, that is their goal so that is why typically when i'm looking at a pharmaceutical company they are kind of trying to target um, diseases uh, which can affect a big population so for example when you're looking at diseases such as cardiovascular diseases or you're looking at diabetes they are uh, uh, there you know they, uh, you have a huge population who are suffering from those conditions and then uh, therefore if a drug company is able to develop a therapeutic uh, which can affect these diseases then probably uh, they'll be able to make a uh, good profit but here in this case uh, 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 if you are looking at the disease called as chronic myelogenous leukemia you can almost see it as a uh, rare disease because uh, not too many people are um, uh, affected by that so probably right now if you kind of can see the population in the us maybe you have close to between uh, uh, 5 to uh, 6000 patients who are uh, suffering from this disease so that tells you that uh, it is not a huge population so this is where uh, you can see that uh, both uh, Dr. Drucker as well as um, Sawyer, they made a sales pitch. So they talked to Chibaka again, then uh, they kind of you know, uh, convinced them that uh, since we have already done this discovery, and then we can see that the um, uh, the oncogene B cell labels and kinase is uh, uh, overexpressed in patients with CML. You had to kind of go forward and try to do a uh, clinical trial to uh, discover a drug molecule for this disease. And uh, not only that, even we had patient uh, advocacy group. In terms of that, uh, patients who were suffering from the disease CML in the US, they also wrote a uh, letter to the pharma company Siba Gaigi uh, requesting them to conduct uh, clinical trials. Uh, um, to uh, see whether uh, we'll be able to um, develop a drug molecule to treat CML. So this is where you can see that uh, uh, the entire team, you, you have bench scientists collaborating with the uh, clinician and also you have, we have patient advocacy group who uh, also together were able to convince the pharmaceutical company to, to go forward and then conduct uh, clinical trials uh, to develop uh, this drug uh, imatinib. And then eventually the uh, pharmaceutical company also agreed and then um, uh, you know they were able to um, kind of uh, discover um, uh, this drug called as uh, imatinib and uh, this is the uh, classic example where you can see that uh, uh, who, uh, we kind of had a good team effort as well as coordination from uh, various uh, stakeholders such as um, Ben scientists as well as a uh, clinician and uh, pharmaceutical company and also patient uh, advocacy group and uh, because of this um, combination or because of this team effort eventually um, uh, they were able to discover this drug and then at that time you can see that um, this was a uh, major breakthrough because till then when you look at cancer therapy uh, generally uh, you had this cytotoxic drugs and then uh, which are not really selective for cancer cells, but uh, they would also target other uh, uh, healthy cells as well, which kind of lead to a lot of, lot of cytotoxicity. But then uh, uh, imatinib kind of changed all that and then uh, that kind of developed this targeted therapy approach where you, uh, uh, you are able to um, show this selective toxicity only towards uh, cancer cells. So uh, this kind of gives an idea about how uh, uh, translational uh, research can be uh, useful to um, discover uh, novel drug candidates in uh, in a short period of time. So if you uh, look at this slide, this kind of gives a timeline about uh, hematinib uh, discovery. So basically, uh, they were able to identify this drug back in 1990. And then after that, they kind of started the uh, uh, first synthesis in 1992 and then after that uh, they kind of uh, um, um, uh, were able to show its effectiveness in animal models or in pre um, clinical studies and then they conduct started doing uh, clinical trials in 1998 and eventually the uh, 
drug was launched by US FDA in uh, 2001. So basically, it took them close to uh, 11 years. And then uh, soon after the uh, discovery of uh, imatinib, um, within five years, um, they were able to develop uh, another drug to treat CML. And uh, this drug was uh, called as uh, dasatinib. And that's where, again, um, you know, uh, you can see that um, translational uh, research uh, was able to contribute uh, in the discovery of that drug as well. Uh, since we kind of you know, talked about uh, translation research, so maybe I can ask you a question here. So if you see the slide here, this uh, kind of you know, has a question. Translational research includes, so we have five options. A, basic science research. B, preclinical studies. C, clinical studies. And then D, either B or C or uh, E. Either you have to pick A or B or C. So if you uh, recall, uh, when we uh, looked at the definition of uh, translational uh, research, uh, we, uh, we had a figure there which kind of says that translational research has four different stages. You have T0, T1, T2, T3, as well as T4. So when you're looking at T0, that talks about um, basic research. And when you look at T1 all the way to T3, you're looking at uh, clinical science um, uh, research and then when you're looking at T4, you are, uh, it's, it's talking about actual uh, translation into uh, clinical practice. So that's where uh, uh, the answer is uh, basically E. So when you're looking at translation research that uh, includes basic science, it includes um, clinical studies and also it includes uh, clinical studies. So uh, with that, uh, let me just uh, uh, go through another uh, topic here. So we'll try to look at the classic uh, issues with traditional uh, drug discovery. So when you're looking at uh, traditional drug di um, discovery, this is what it is. So if you look at this figure here, that kind of nicely gives you a summary. Uh, you can see that basically there is there is a big gap between basic science as well as uh, clinical science. So you can look at this here. Um, you can look at uh, uh, the, uh, if, if you kind of want to see the figure here, uh, you can uh, look at this part as the basic science. And then you look at the uh, other part here, you, you can uh, look at it as uh, clinical science. And then you can clearly see that uh, there is there is no communication or coordination between basic science and then uh, clinical science. And then uh, eventually the uh, patient is going to suffer. And um, this is where, when you're looking at translation science, uh, it can uh, it can actually uh, address this uh, knowledge gap in basic science as well as um, clinical science, so that um, uh, all the basic science findings will ultimately be used in actual um, clinical practice. So I do see that uh, I think in the chat box there are some questions. So maybe uh, what I'll do is that uh, once I uh, complete my talk, then I can uh, kind of answer those uh, questions. So uh, now again, uh, when I'm looking at uh, the advantage of using translational practice in um, drug development, there are uh, lots of things to consider. So uh, we know that when you're looking at translational science uh, or translational uh, research, it has these four stages, T0 all the way to T4. And uh, when you're looking at a traditional drug development process, you can look at T0 all the way to T3 as valley of death. Why you call it? Because when you're looking at traditional drug discovery, oftentimes uh, what happens is that more than 90% of uh, new discoveries don't really go all the way. So suppose if a company uh, is interested in developing a novel drug molecule, then chances of that succeeding are really less. It's very low. Why is that? Because there are a um, number of uh, reasons. Oftentimes, you may have that, um, you may get good um, activity in uh, preclinical studies, but in when you actually try it in humans, then probably the drug candidate may not be effective. And then oftentimes, you may see toxicity issues. And then sometimes you have pharmacokinetics uh, issues. And uh, and then sometimes even the um, uh, drug company might go bankrupt. Or there is a chance that the uh, um, drug company might do a 
benefit to um, risk analysis and then in the end they may see that probably if they're able to spend a lot of money in discovering a new drug maybe the uh, return uh, um, may not be financially viable and then at that time they may kind of you know, stop the trial so again you can see that when i'm looking at uh, the traditional method of uh, drug discovery it has uh, lots of uh, drawbacks and then this is where um, translational uh, research uh, comes into play so uh, for example when you implement this translational uh, research practice in uh, drug development then uh, that can actually make sure that uh, the uh, chances of uh, success of your drug candidate is going to be a lot higher so uh, when you implement translational uh, research practices you can improve the um, uh, drug uh, efficacy you can also um, develop uh, novel assays where uh, uh, you can uh, predict the to toxicity of a drug molecule to a uh, good extent so that uh, it will be more um, uh, reflective about uh, what can happen in a uh, human population and then uh, similarly when you're looking at uh, translational uh, research practice it's a team effort and then uh, you can actually um, uh, incorporate other uh, partners as well as uh, 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 you can develop this uh, private uh, public partnership uh, so that you'll have uh, sufficient funds to carry out all the um, all the uh, preclinical as well as uh, clinical trials required to successfully translate a basic science discovery into actual um, Uh, clinical practice so in the end you can see that once you start implementing this translation uh, research practices that can uh, decrease the time involved in uh, drug discovery and also that can actually um, um, uh, increase the chances of success of your drug candidate so uh, again you know, i'm kind of from talking about um, uh, 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 talking about uh, Uh, uh you know all is uh, uh, information in general and um, again i can see that there are um, there are a couple of uh, questions which are popping out so probably uh, i will kind of uh, uh, answer that in the end and going forward uh, now when i will kind of now when i'm looking at ch uh, challenges in in, in translation research practice again there are a uh, number of them and then i have uh, uh, only uh, highlighted some of the key points so for example uh, one of the biggest drawbacks or in a challenges in translation uh, research is education and training so basically uh, we need to have um, uh, people uh, who, who are trained uh, in translation uh, research so uh, for example whether you are looking at a basic scientist or whether you are looking at a uh, uh, clinician they all should have a background in um, in um, interdisciplinary research which is uh, really important because probably uh, you may have a very good um, bench scientist but um, uh, they may not have a uh, good background in uh, uh, clinical science and then it, it's the same thing so you may have a, a very good physician or a um, or a um, uh, clinician but uh, they may not have any um, knowledge in conducting uh, experimental science so this is where um, uh, you can see that uh, uh, lack of training um, uh, can be an issue and then i am um, uh, uh, the other thing to kind of you know, uh, consider is that uh, when i'm looking at um, all the uh, major hospitals um, when you when you look at them they have all the uh, infrastructure uh, which are required to conduct translational uh, um, research but the a uh, big uh, uh, issue is that uh, they do not have any um, dedicated time or um, uh, or uh, any type of health centers to um, facilitate or conduct um, experimental uh, research that's a big drawback because when i'm looking at um, uh, i think um, um, you know big hospitals such as kmc manipal or in any other uh, big hospitals in india uh the major focus is on uh, uh, on patient care and then they offer all kinds of uh, clinical uh, services but then uh, there is um, lack of um, uh, focus on conducting uh, actual research so that is a drawback and then uh, again you know because of that you can see that although you kind of have uh, have a nice hospital with all the uh, uh, infrastructure but then uh, they are all uh, mostly uh, utilized in uh, uh, in offering their uh, 
clinical um, services. And then uh, another uh, thing to kind of consider is that government support. So again, uh, especially for uh, academic institutes, suppose if you want to conduct uh, translation uh, research, then uh, it's uh, very important for the um, government to have a uh, dedicated uh, stream of funding uh, which the um, academic uh, institute can use. So that is something to um, consider. And then also uh, when you are looking at pharmaceutical in industry, uh, again, uh, they should also get some kind of uh, uh, incentive from the government. Uh, probably they can get, get some uh, tax breaks to conduct uh, translation uh, research. And then apart from that, uh, even, you know, um, uh, one has to kind of think about trying to develop uh, a um, uh, collaborative effort between the um, academic institute as well as the uh, industry where uh, they can uh, kind of um, collaborate and then they can um, um, come up with um, translational um, research. That's important. And then um, uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, it's also important to um, have a team uh, which has actual patience because in the end, uh, the goal is to see whether uh, we can improve uh, patient care. And this is where uh, one has to uh, educate the uh, patients as well. So if you uh, see the um, example of uh, imatinib, there we saw that um, patient uh, advocacy groups played an important role. So they actually wrote a uh, letter to the pharmaceutical company uh, uh, requesting them to conduct uh, clinical trials to discover a, a new drug molecule. So this is where I think um, uh, um, educating or, um, uh, or creating uh, awareness in the uh, patient community is also very important. So uh, then I guess if you're looking at uh, um, uh, some of the opportunities or uh, sort of uh, strategies that can be implemented to enhance the field of uh, translational uh, research is again, you know, there are uh, lots of things to consider and then I have uh, highlighted some of the key factors here. So uh, probably when I'm looking at uh, academic uh, uh, institutes, they can actually try to um, develop um, uh, programs which can separate uh, or you know, which can train uh, um, uh, personnel in um, translational uh, research. So, for example, they can start an um, uh, undergraduate or uh, postgraduate uh, programs in uh, translation research so that uh, uh, you can have uh, skilled personnel who have the uh, necessary background to conduct uh, translation research and then also probably when you're looking at a big uh, uh, big you know, hospital like uh, KMC Manipal, they can actually create uh, dedicated uh, health centers uh, which are focused on carrying out uh, translation research and then uh, uh, and uh, probably uh, you know if they kind of uh, if they can kind of do that I think that will be great because you can see that when you're looking at KMC Manipal, they uh, not only in, in uh, Manipal, but also in uh, um, other parts of India and also in other countries, they have their uh, uh, their own hospitals. So this is where if they can create a uh, create this a network of uh, uh, health centers which are focused on conducting uh, translational um, uh, um, research, then uh, uh, that will give a big push. And apart from that, again, when you're looking at um, government, they have to have uh, dedicated uh, streams of funding uh, which will support um, translational uh, research, uh, which will also help all the um, uh, academic institutes in India to pursue um, translation research. And then again, uh, um, uh, one can also open the channel of uh, communication with the uh, pharmaceutical industry where uh, you, you can come up with this uh, partnerships or um, uh, collaborative effort uh, to conduct um, uh, translational uh, uh, research. So again, when you're looking at uh, pharmaceutical companies, you have to understand that they are a uh, for-profit uh, corporation, and then uh, that's where uh, they would be uh, keen on uh, uh, protecting the intellectual property, and uh, ultimately it, it can lead to um, uh, commercial opportunities, and then uh, definitely both the uh, academic uh, institute as well as the industry is going to uh, benefit by uh, by a uh, joint collaboration 
and then again uh, you can see that uh, uh, patients are important and uh, uh, we had to uh, create a program where uh, patients are uh, constantly uh, educated on uh, translational uh, research so that uh, 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 they will also benefit and then uh, uh, and uh, they also will be able to push the uh, uh, other stakeholders such as the government as well as the pharmaceutical company to uh, pursue uh, research related to uh, translation research. And then uh, uh, the kind of an other uh, big opportunity in uh, translation research is that uh, there are lots of diseases which uh, uh, do not have any um, drug therapies. So uh, for example, right now, if you kind of now see the, uh, uh, the drugs, so uh, totally there are close to 600 uh, human diseases uh, for which we have a drug therapy. But if you see the actual number of uh, human diseases, there are close to 8,000 um, different diseases. And then you can see that we have therapies only for a uh, fraction of those. So there are lots of these uh, rare um, diseases for which there is no therapy. So again, when uh, uh, that kind of tells you that there is a big um, opportunity in uh, translational uh, research to discover uh, novel drugs for all these other diseases. So again, you know, that's a big um, uh, area to kind of you know, focus because we have a lot more diseases uh, for which there are no uh, treatment options. And then uh, that kind of you know, opens a uh, big area for uh, translational research. So with, uh, with that, uh, now you know, I'll kind of you know, briefly talk about the uh, role of nursing. So um, I guess when you're looking at nursing, uh, it has a, uh, a very rich history of conducting uh, translation uh, research. So probably, uh, I guess in uh, you guys know um, uh, you guys know better than me. So uh, for example, I think when I'm looking at uh, Florence uh, Nightingale, she kind of you know, did the uh, did a uh, first study where she kind of you know, uh, looked at uh, uh, soldiers, and then she was able to conduct clinical trials. And then uh, again, you know, we all know that uh, nursing um, uh, practitioners um, are uh, right at the uh, forefront of uh, patient care. And uh, uh, as you can tell right now, even with the COVID-19 pandemic going on, we know that um, uh, nursing community was um, right at the forefront. And uh, they are the ones who are directly uh, interacting with patients and their, uh, uh, and their caregivers whether it's in a community setup or uh, whether it's in a uh, primary care or whether it's a, it's a short term care or a long term care they are the ones who are uh, who are kind of uh, who are kind of dealing with the uh, patients and also their uh, caregivers and then they will have um, you know more insight in terms of uh, um, uh, often trying to develop a novel drug molecule or trying to look at uh, potential uh, biomarkers or try to develop uh, diagnostic agents and that's where uh, I think um, um, you know, uh, one should basically focus, uh, try to train um, uh, the uh, nursing um, uh, practitioners. So this is where I think you know, we should have more uh, PhD programs uh, which can actually um, support um, to develop um, nurse uh, scientists. And the idea is that you know, if you have a uh, nurse scientist who have who has a PhD and with uh, interdisciplinary uh, training, they can actually um, um, lead these um, uh, these uh, clinical trials. So this is where, if you when you look at uh, translation research, uh, we saw that it has four different stages. You have T0, you have T1, T2, T3, as well as T4. And uh, you can see that uh, suppose if you have trained uh, nursing uh, or you know, nurse scientists, they can contribute in uh, at uh, every stage of this uh, translational uh, research. And then I can see that they can actually make um, major uh, contribution in T4 stage where you actually try to uh, translate the basic science finding into actual uh, clinical uh, practice. So this is where I think uh, when you're looking at uh, nursing program uh, it's kind of uh, kind of a very important to develop uh, uh, and support programs which can kind of uh, support um, uh, the uh, interdisciplinary training and so that uh, you can develop uh, uh, nurse uh, scientists who can actually lead some of this uh, translation research uh, 